Um, uh, okay, so we're, first of all, can I, oh no, no, that would make me feel really awful. No, I'll, I'll, I'll stay here for the moment, and if I get tired, I'll leave again. <laughs> um, again, I want to thank Joan for uh, organising another wonderful, what will be, I'm sure, another wonderful weekend uh, down here, and for having the creativity to ask for ideas for different panels um, to kick off on the Friday night. And I'm particularly pleased to have a panel um, of women to discuss women in comedy, because I think, well, number one, I think comedy is very important in any society. The, you know, the ability that we have as people to laugh is, is very important, but the gift that anybody has to be able to make people laugh is particularly precious. Um, so that's number one reason. Number two is that I think we're at an interesting time at the moment, particularly in Ireland as regards comedy, because um, we seem to be at a kind of a golden age for comedy programs, and a lot of that is actually being driven by Irish women. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a good time for us to have a look and to have a wee bit of a chat about comedy. So in so doing, we have a, a wonderful panel um, to discuss all things comedic this evening. So I'm going to start at the, the far end. Um, we have Fiona Looney, who's a columnist and a playwright and a comedy writer. Um, Fiona uh, writes two columns every week in the Daily Mail. Um, she also writes satire for um, Oliver Callan's program, Callan's Kicks. She also tells me she's, I think she said she has 703 writing projects on the table at the moment. Um, so she's very busy um, and unfortunately is going to be heading back to Dublin tomorrow. Um, but she's probably also, I'm sure a lot of you still remember Fiona's uh, fabulous contributions to the Jerry Ryan show on 2FM. Um, and she often sat in for Jerry um, uh, when he wasn't there. So um, will you welcome Fiona Lundy? And sitting beside Fiona, we have the effervescent <laughs> and Catherine Lynch, who is well known to all, actress and comedian, who um, is familiar to us from her various different characters and personas that she has brought to life on RT television, on various different uh, series that she's had over the year over the years. More recently, she has uh, participated in some reality TV programs, and if she doesn't give up some serious gossip about Operation Transformation and Dancing with the Stars, we're not going to be friends. So, <laughs> Catherine is also a partner in a TV production company uh, with uh, her partner, Warren Myler. They've produced many documentaries, including, um, you've probably remember the one, um, with Brendan Courtney, he must talk about his dad, which uh, was quite a serious documentary. So she has a serious side as well, which we you know, might talk about a little bit. And last but not least, um, we have bringing the uh, age profile down a little bit. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm only 21, you can check my rings if you like. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, we have Aoife Dooley. Aoife is a, an illustrator and an author and a, a comedian also. Um, she is probably best known online for her comedic um, um, invention of Your One Nikita, um, which is online. She's done some videos and she's done some illustrations. She's also published two books. Actually, Aoife makes me feel really um, ineffective. She's published two books, How to Be Massive and How to Deal with Poxes on a Daily Basis. <laughs> And she has recently started doing stand-up and won New Magazine's 30 Under 30 Award for Best Comedian in 2017. So, First of all, can I start by asking um, all of you, is being funny a bit of a pain in the ass? In other words, in your social lives, which I presume you all have and you have friends, um, when you go out socially, because you're the, the funny person, the person who's known to be the funny person, does everybody kind of sit back and go, okay, great, here's Fiona, here's Catherine, here's Aoife, so, you know, let's all be entertained. Fiona? Yes. Yeah. Yes, that happens. Okay. Um, Barbara, you know this, because I, I go out with you and you just sit there doing nothing. Yeah. And, no, listen, it, it, like, it's actually a lovely thing to be able to... God, it's going to sound really big-headed, but it, it... Thank you. Um, to... to you know, to be able to make people laugh is a great gift. And I, I know from my point of view, when I started writing, um, when I started writing, you know, creatively, for ages and ages I tried to sit on my funny, funny, I said, um, and, and not let it out, you know, and I wrote, like I wrote plays, at the, at my very first play, which was called Dandelions, and I thought it was a really kind of serious comment on like an achingly sad piece about women's friendship. 
And I went to the first preview and I was kind of going, this is, it's too sad. Like, I'm actually, I hope people are not so upset that they, you know, like, will have to drag themselves out of the theatre. Um, and I just thought, and they just laughed like drains for the night. And you kind of go, okay, I'm actually too funny, you know. And I, I, try, I really tried to stop that. But you know what? It's really easy to make people sad. And it's so much better to make people happy. So I don't God mind the don't mind. Catherine, how do you feel about that? Well, I'd like to say thank you first to everyone here uh, for coming to my vagina naming um, <laughs> ceremony. <laughs> I'm going to call it Tom after Big Tom. <laughs> okay, so is that all right with everyone? So thank you very much. If we have a nun in the room, could you come up and bless us? <laughs> You've left all that very late, Catherine, if you don't mind Blessing and the naming, yeah. Oh, yeah, well, no, well, let's not. Tom had to die. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, no, being funny, I don't know. Um, I really don't think I'm as funny as my friends because I go out and they make me laugh and I absorb all their lines, rob them of them, and then try and put it together and then uh, make other people laugh. So, I, I don't know, I think every, all Irish people are funny. There's none of us that go to the pub and don't have an absolute howl, do we, really? That's what we want to get away from all our woes and our... Although not all Irish people are funny. Some Irish people are not funny at all. Like who? Dana! <laughs> Dana's not very funny, is she really? <laughs> Aoife, what about you? I agree. I'm, I'm the same. Like I prefer to like kind of be in a group of people and like if I make someone smile, like that kind of means a lot to me. Like even if they're having a bad day. So and as Fiona said, it's easy for to make people sad, but to make people happy, like is a completely different thing. But I think that's what drives me and like what I do as well. I like when. I see people online like tagging their friends, going, "Oh, that's you," and having a laugh. Or even in like like if I do a stand up gig and there's people there like and they're laughing. I love that because it just it's just a powerful thing like for people to be laughing at something you're saying. Because when you go up on stage, you don't expect people to laugh. You hope for them to laugh because the audience owes you nothing. So and it's same with when you're out as well. Like I, I will kind of I think I'm pretty much well, I'm pretty close to the same person I would be on stage when I'm out. So. I, I, I don't think I'd have too much pressure on me from my friends saying, oh, you know, oh, tell us a joke. Like, there'd be none of that, like, but I'd just be myself. Like, but, like, yeah, I like making people happy, so if that's going to, yeah. Fiona, you've been around for a long time. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite as long as you. But Not, as long. Not as long as me, no, no. <laughs> We have, a, we, have a, we have a standing joke, um, uh, Fiona and I see each other quite regularly, we have a standing joke about who Fiona took to her Debs. Gay Byrne. <laughs> He's a lovely man. He loved it. <laughs> but you started off, seriously, you started off as a journalist in Hot Press, and actually there is a video, if anybody cares to, to Google, of Fiona being very earnest on a panel once when you were about 17 or something. But you obviously started off ser wanting to be a serious journalist. And I mean, you still are a serious uh, no, it, it, no, I actually didn't. To be very honest, I wanted to write, and I, I wanted to write creatively. But, you know, growing up in the 1970s and the 1980s in a fairly working class part of Dublin, that was never, that just wasn't an option. I mean, you might as well, have, you know, come in and said, I want to go to the moon. You know, it, it just wasn't going to happen. So I, because I liked writing, I did a journalism degree, but I, a degree. <laughs> I did a journalism course, I didn't do a journalism degree, um, and I went to Hot Press because I knew that they were a little bit kind of free and easy in the way they wrote, they didn't follow the rules. What I didn't know, and I was incredibly lucky in this, was that at the same time that I went to Hot Press, a number of other people joined the magazine at the same time, Arthur Matthews and Graeme Linehan are probably the two most well known for what happened, kind of, to them. Tell but there people were, what happened in case. Well, I, I, I'd like to, to, to go back to the mid 80s. So we all arrived, and it wasn't just them, there were about five or six of us, and we liked making each other laugh. Like, we loved music and we liked writing about music, but primarily we liked making each other laugh, and we were kind of a bit competitive. And one of the guys who was working there, a guy called Paul Wonderful, Paul Woodfull, had a band called the Joshua Trio which was a comedy um, tribute band in huge inverted commas to you too. Um, and we started doing gigs every Tuesday night and they became like comedy reviews. And I've subsequently seen Graeme Linehan referring to Hot Press as our footlights, which, you know, it was it, like totally by accident. We started doing these gigs on Tuesday nights in the Baggot Inn. 
Paul would do his Joshua Trio thing. And then Arthur Matthews had this character that he had developed just all by himself in his head called Father Ted Crilly. And he would put on, you know, the, the bit of white paper into a black shirt. And he would stand up in between the various acts and he would ask for money. And it was always money that was ultimately going to be resting in his account. But it was like, he, you know, he would make these appeals for things like um, Irish language books for children in Africa, you know, to, to further their, their use of the Irish language. And actually, sorry, but bear with me. A, a funny story, because very few people know this, and I think this is a wonderful story. Around that time, Arthur was going over to London, um, and it was the very early days of Ryanair, and he was sitting beside a man on the flight. And uh, like Arthur was going over something completely unrelated to, you know, anything work-wise, whatever. And this man struck up conversation with them and said, what do you do for a living? And Arthur, who was, oh God, early 20s, said, I'm a priest. And the man said, oh my God, you're a very young priest. And he said, what's your name? And he said, my name is Father Ted Crilly. <laughs> and he proceeded to tell him all this stuff he was doing about raising money. And I am convinced, this is years before Father Ted, and I am convinced to this day, that man must be out there going, what? <laughs> because like, you he, know, he actually met Father Ted. Ted before Father, when Father Ted was still a twinkle. So obviously Arthur and Graham went off to write Father Ted and that opened doors for all of us who were in that group of people because we were all part of this kind of, you know, traveling circus for want of a better description. And so, that's what did you I, do at the travelling circus at the Baggett Inn? I sang backing no. vocals for the Joshua Trio. I thought I told you that before. Um, and other. I'll just remember you know, that later and, on. And then, like, we did an ABBA tribute band, but like a comedy one. It was called Abattoir, because we slaughtered the songs of ABBA. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, so as a result of that, doors opened to me in RTE, like, producers were kind of, you know, to all yeah. of us, inviting us to write stuff and... Yeah, so that's how I got into it, was really through hot press and just being a happy accident of being in the right place at the right time. Right, so you've been doing the funny stuff uh, from the get-go. Yeah. Catherine, your start, uh, as far as I, I, I think I'm right in saying, kind of came through the gay community, yeah. um, where you won Miss Alternative Ireland in 1998. I was. I did. I won and Miss Alternative Can I just Ireland. say, before you tell us about that, that I'm sure this is the only conference anywhere on the planet, I don't know where Joan's got, where there will be two winners of the Alternative yeah. Miss Ireland on this stage over the weekend. The other one being Sinead Burke, who's here and, on and Sunday. And the only two girls. And the only two women. Tell us about Miss Alternative Ireland and, and who you were. Well, I won Alternative Miss Ireland in 1998, so it's 20 year anniversary of the wonderful character that was called Tampi Lalette, a periodically obsessed country and western star. I'm telling you the truth now, you asked the question, so... <laughs> Basically, she jumped, jumped out of a huge tampon and said, So, I'm a little early. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's how she started. And then she got a hot water bottle and she started singing, uh, Jump in the bench, blood starts pumping, all this sort of stuff. It was very... I know, I know, I know, I was horrified. But not as horrified as, as Louis Walsh was in the audience. And um, it's normally a show for drag queens, so basically everyone was kind of peering at this girl because I wore wigs and lashes and everything that you could throw at me, the opposite to the Dior rule. You know, I just threw more things at me, I didn't take them off. But um, so Louis looked up and he, and he said I, to somebody, I thought that, that I heard this in hindsight, I thought this was supposed to be for drag queens. Um, you know, um, is that a man or a woman? And he said, no. That's a man I'd know by his hands. <laughs> you fucker, Louis. Repeat after me, you fucker, Louis. What two? <laughs> yeah, he'd love that. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, so that was what happened. So 1998, in uh, Panty was the host. And um, so in front of 2,500 people, my first audience was 2,500 people. And um, I won, and I didn't know what to do with winning. I didn't really go out to win. We had 50 uh, pounds, that's uh, at the time, um, to buy our costumes, and we bought them in Oxfam's. And we were at to literally walked out to, um, it was in the red box at the time. We literally walked out, and the George's truck went by like a big whale going by. And inside they had ice coffins, they had back and dancers, they probably had the Joshua Trio, and you back and singing. And uh, 
Um, yeah, so I went out and won and sure, that catapulted me into a big gay community that I can only thank. And I was raised by drag queens after that. And I met character after character after character. And I suppose and, that's where I got characters. And you and Miss Panty Bliss also appeared on American television, didn't you? Uh, yeah. Lying to the entire world that you were a brother and sister. Yeah, Panty, now this is like, I don't, this was 1998 as well. So Panty like met me in the nightclub and said, hey muff, that was my nickname in the nightclub. <laughs> We, I don't know why, but anyway, uh, so he said, uh, would you come to America with me and pretend that, um, that you're my sister on the Maury Palvey show? And I went, yeah, of course. What the fuck are you talking about? But anyway, so I went home, got my uh, passport, got into uh, an airplane with Panty, went over, were picked up in a disco limo um, in Kennedy Airport. I had never been to uh, America before and uh, brought to Pen the Pennsylvania, they have studios underneath. We walked in and there's um, all the stars, Ricky Lake was there, and there was all these daytime TV people, which I had been watching a lot of daytime TV at the time, I was in Bull Alley. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we ended up on that show and I pretended I was Panty's sister, and it's probably, you can get it on, talking about media, you can get it on YouTube, just click in Catherine Lynch and Panty Bliss, and it's hilarious, it really is. We lied to the whole of America, way before Borat or anything like that, and it was hilarious for us in our little world, but nobody else knew about it. The first, us. the first yeah. fake news. Yeah. Fake Having, news. <laughs> again, asking, uh, and I'll come to you in a sec, Eva, but asking both you, Fiona, and Catherine, back when you guys started off, um, was it harder for women in comedy? Because we have, you know, we constantly hear about the fact that comedy tends to be still a very male-driven um, type of place to be. Um, would you have both found as a woman that it was lonely or it was difficult or not? Do you know, to be very honest, there was a, the attitude back, I say back then, the attitude up until about six months ago, and I'm not joking about that, I mean, honestly, like, I cannot tell you, you know, you mentioned I'm writing 307 projects. I really kind of am, and it's all because of the Me Too, you're not Me Too, but the, the um, Waking the Feminist movement in this country and the, the, the gender skewing, you know, like rightly or wrongly, no matter how you feel about it, the net result of that is that women in the creative arts are, have never been busier and, you know, really reaping the rewards. And now you kind of go, wow. You know, it took me to this age, 27, to get to this point, to get to this point. And you kind of go, like, what was going on before then? The, the, the situation, can, and, and I know for a fact this is true of you, but, I mean, you can contradict me. The, the trick is to be the token woman, but to know you're the token woman. So when you were doing, for years and years, if you're doing comedy panel shows, you know, you'll have a producer who will say, we'll say, for example, you're doing, and I mean, I've done so many of them over the years. You have a male host. You have three panelists on each team. So you have six people. So you have seven people. One of those will be female. This is up till six months ago. Now, five of those will be female. But up till six months ago, six of them were going to be male. And the trick was to be the seventh one, to be the woman who got the phone call. And I was very lucky, and I know Catherine was very lucky, that we got the phone calls. And from that point of view, it wasn't lonely, but at the same time, you know the only reason you got that phone call is because they needed to actually tick a box. And that's not great. And when I did a Wagon's Den, I had, I was a, it was a female-based show, and I had a token bloke just to piss them off. <laughs> Aoife, you're newer to this whole um, uh, scene, and I know re you've only relatively recently started to do stand-up. Um, would you find it now that, are you aware of the fact that you're a woman in a kind of a, uh, what has been a male-dominated, or is it not relevant any longer? Is it? Um, no, I definitely think it's still relevant, but maybe for some people, but for me, like, I've never kind of, like, it's probably, like, different for me, because I, I kind of go in and I'll go and ask for gigs, and I won't kind of be afraid to ask for gigs, and I'll just go in and just say, start your gigs going and that's what you're going to have to do as well like you have to kind of ask around like and it's not an embarrassing thing that's how you get to do stand up and get into it and then to kind of get different gigs for to practice for festivals and that kind of thing but like um, no it's kind of I actually haven't had any kind of issue with being a woman in comedy I've, I, I feel personally myself that I've been treated fairly which is great like I feel like I'm lucky in that way 
But what, I, what I've come up against in comedy is more for being working class. And that, that's, kind, that's kind of a thing that's come up with me. And it's like I've had a gig, like I won't make name any names, like, but I've had gigs like where I've come off stage, someone's put their arm on my back as if they're going to say, that was a great gig, and then turned around to me and said, you sound like a junkie. And I just think, you know, there's a lot of that kind of nastiness in there, but it's the, it's the people that you surround yourself with as well. You quickly learn who to be around and who not to be around. And you, you find out very quickly that the people who everyone else doesn't want to be around, it's for that very reason, like that, that they're like that with everyone, they're bitter, and they're not kind of getting to where they want to be, and there's like new people coming in, and that's what it's kind of, I find there's a lot of that there, as opposed to kind of not getting gigs for being a woman. But then at the same time, I, I do find like there, there is like, you know, there is like, you know, most gigs you go to, there's more men and women that's still very much like that. Like, and that's why I think with like um, Electric Picnic this year, you know, they have an all female lineup like for the first time ever, which I think is amazing. Like it's just something different. But even with that, then you still get people going, well, why isn't there all male lineup? Why isn't that, you know what I mean? There's kind of, it's, yeah. But you're riding that same wave that yeah. Fiona talked about of suddenly yeah, there yeah. being a conscious decision to include more women. Yeah, big time, um, yeah. Which is good. Well, on the same kind of then, as part of that, perhaps or perhaps not, um, I mean, it has been written um, recently in various different uh, uh, things that we are at a golden age of comedy. I mean, you mentioned Father Ted. When you try and think back on comedy programs on television that were really standout, there's not that many. You know, Father Ted being one, um, the one with your man Crawford, what was his name, a million years ago. Yeah, yeah. What was that? Some of us do have them. Um, Faulty Towers. Um, but recently we seem to have had a lot of, and particularly here in Ireland, we seem to have had, be producing a lot of really good comedy. Uh, Dairy Girls, I think, is, is Standout, which is written by an Irish woman. You've had Stephanie Kreisner, um, who has written Can't Cope, Won't Cope, which is now on Netflix. Um, and Alison Spittle also know her fast. Um, have you any ideas as to why that is? Is it part of this deliberate thing to nurture women? Or is it also, or is it separately that women write differently do women find different things funny is it a yeah and you know what i'm, I'm going to throw the young offenders in there as well which is not written by a woman obviously but it's a fantastic show and yeah. uh, and you know what I, I think a lot of it is a coincidence there's a little bit more money in the country so people vai not RT, i mean rte I won't get into the politics of it, but the BAI have more money, therefore more content is being made. Um, and because we are gender skewing at the moment, and because everyone is gender skewing, a lot of that is coming from women. Um, now, you know, it's great that people are making more comedy. The, 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 com the, the, the sitcoms you named there, I mean, I could name you another 50 that are really good and that people don't remember. And... I've no idea in 20 years time if anyone will remember Derry with all with, fantastic that they are I'm not sure that they will actually hit that gold standard I mean certainly you know I was very involved in the father Ted world and I was at all the recordings did we have any idea that it would still be around 20 years on not a clue so it's very hard to know you know hindsight is a great thing and all that um, but you know like I would just say that the I, I look forward to the, 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 the gender skewing, and I keep using that phrase, is necessary and is overdue. I look forward to when it stops and we all settle into, because men are really funny too, you know, and I look forward to a time, because I know a lot of men, I mean, I didn't know that the electric picnic comedy lineup was all female. I'm slightly horrified by that, I have to say. Well, no, yeah, I don't think so either because like it's it's not like to say that oh it's an all female lineup and like males can't like be included like that's not what it was set up for like Emily O'Callaghan set it up like so like she had a mixture of like yeah. people who have been doing comedy for a while and people who are starting now some people who haven't got a chance to do that like I think she's doing a really great thing and I do know where you're coming from yeah. saying that like you know well males are a great comedy and you know like what you're saying there like but. It's, it's not about that, it's just about like she was setting it up and it, it has got kind of, you know, mixed reviews and I do it get exactly where you're coming from. Like, you know, at the same time, it's like, why, like people are asking, why is there an all female lineup? But like, why not? Like, do you know what I mean? Like no one ever asks like, you know, why is that an all male lineup? No one ever no, asks that, so do you know what I mean? But, but, yeah. Yeah, but it, Poor it, men. 
Yeah, no, but I, I, I do. I do honestly look forward to a day when, when we return to kind of that the best people yeah. are the people yeah. on the bill uh, uh, in yeah. everything. In it everything. shouldn't yeah. matter about your gender. Yeah. It should be just yeah. like if you're good at what you do, that's it. Like it shouldn't matter like with the body that you're in. It's yeah, yeah exactly. But it's like a pendulum, isn't it? It has to swing the whole way the other way before it'll come yeah, back absolutely. into the centre. And I look forward to that as well. Uh, kind of on a similar vein, Eva, can you talk to us a little bit because you're kind of. Um, fame, your, your success has come really from an online presence and from harnessing of social media, um, which is something that wasn't around obviously when the other two were starting off. <laughs> um, <laughs> I had the first uh, computer in Leitrim. Oh! <laughs> right beside the traffic lights. But do you think that social media, because there aren't gatekeepers, you know, there aren't producers, there aren't um, broadcast companies that you have to talk to, that it makes it easier for somebody like you to get your, your stuff out there and to start gathering a following? Um, I think, yeah, I think it's kind of made it a lot easier in the last couple of years with people on social media making pages and stuff. But at the same time, I think it's it's what you're talking about, like it has to be relevant, it has to be new, it has to be fresh. It's still kind of hard to do those things. And what I set up my Facebook page, I only set it up for the reason that like when I left college, I studied graphic design and um, I wanted to be an illustrator. And there's no jobs in advertising agencies or graphic design agencies as an illustrator. It's a freelance job, it's, you're pretty much out on your own. So when I left, I had no work on, so I set up a Facebook page to keep myself going, almost like a blog. I was posting up an illustration every day, something that like, you know, related to me or people I knew. And I just started this thing and everyone seemed to kind of just be tagging their friends and they're going, oh, that's you or that's me at the weekend. And it was just a really nice thing because I didn't expect that to happen. So it was kind of, it happened very, very fast. Like, but you the, also, I think, have an, you have to have an eye for what's going to work. Oh, and, yeah, you know, yeah, those short, uh, can I yeah. just share with our audience here what you did earlier? I don't know if any of you ladies yet have been to the ladies' toilet on this floor just out, outside here. Um, but I visited the same toilet that you did earlier in the afternoon. And there is, I don't know if Joan is still here, there is a really scary clown um, in, in, in one of the ladies' toilets, in one of the cubicles, who's holding toilet rolls. His trousers are down and his arse is out. <laughs> <laughs> but it took Eva to go in there to make a video. And I presume you've posted it at this stage, have you yet? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is hilarious of her sitting there looking at this clown and then showing us the clown and in the end she turns him around and, and she's right, his arse is hanging out of his trousers. <laughs> so it is a particular skill I think for yeah, like communi I think, communicating that way. Yeah, like what I usually do is I usually kind of look at like what's current or what's going on and if people are talking about it that's what I'll talk about then and it's kind of... I, I find like if you're talking about something that's like in the media or like that's current, people will latch onto it and kind of They'll, they'll, like, even for example, what I give now. Do you know when uh, Beyonce, for example, was pregnant with her twins? And uh, you know the picture that she took? Yeah, so i done an illustration with my character, Nikita, and she's a big bun. i done a, a picture of her with the same like, veil and everything, but she's sitting there like this, and there's like pizza and Freddo bars and everything around her. Like, so it's kind of, you know, people kind of see it and recognize it for what it is based on the real thing as well. Like, and I think when you do things like that, like, it has more of a chance to go viral, I think it's it's all about knowing your audience really in that way. But it's di more difficult online because when you're doing stand up, you can see your audience. You know what they're gonna be about. You kind of can get a glimpse of like what to do or what what you should and shouldn't do. And but online, you just don't know who's looking. So it's kind of it's a bit more difficult. But I think if you keep it current, that's kind of what draws people in. Okay, so can I ask you, Fiona, about writing satire then, um, which is a very specific type of comedy. Uh, you write for Oliver Callan's um, yeah. program, Callan's Kicks. Um, because satire, and, and, well, first of all, do we have enough of it? Uh, I mean, because I can't think of anything else that's on at the moment other than Oliver Callan's program on, on radio. Um, and I presume you, I mean, I know, and I know this is true, but I, I presume you have to be a current affairs nerd and have a very sharp sense of what's going on, and it has to be very current. So it's, it seems to be a very different kind of skill. It's, it is a totally different discipline, and it's very, it has a very, very fast turnover. I mean, that's... The discipline of it is you have to react to something that has happened an hour beforehand. And um, I mean, Oliver, I can tell you, is a genius. And actually, I'm not a current affairs nerd or a polit politics nerd, but Oliver really is. Um, he also gets genuinely, uh, genuinely angry about stuff. And so he has this real kind of social justice thing going on, which m makes him a great satirist. 
I also have to say that everything, I don't know if, if you listen to the program, but you can podcast it, that's what we really want you to do. Um, Oliver does literally everything himself, and he does, it in a, he does it in a room that is kind of the size of this table, and it's just him and a little 12 track, and he has a magic kind of box of sound effects, and he does that. Uh, there's a wonderful, a wonder, I was going to say a wonderful actor, she actually works in RTE, um, called Lisa Garvey, and she's not an actor in RTE, and she does the women's voices, of which there are not very many, it has to be said, in Callan's Kicks. And when you are writing, it's quite interesting. Mary has of, very good. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, genuinely. Uh, very obviously you're there. Um, but it is interesting on a kind of, you know, because I know you're going to be talking in a broader sense across the weekend about obviously women in the media, women in politics and all this. When you're actually writing a, a kind of a reactive show to the week's events, it's really, really depressing how few women's voices set the news agenda. It just yeah. is. You know, and like, I mean, yeah, well, I mean, Joan's kind of, to be honest, you know, she's not really there anymore. I mean, it's Mary Lou, it's Miriam, it's Claire Byrne. I can count them on one hand, whereas the male voices, you know, there's so many of them. And look, I mean, that's not our, you know, it's not yeah. the fault of Oliver Callan, obviously. But yeah, it is, it is different. It, it's very, very fast. Um, and it's very disposable. It's really disposable. And a lot of people don't, like a lot, we actually have quite a high turnover of writers on the programme. And I think it's because some people don't have the ego or the appetite to know that they could write the funniest thing in the world today and by next week no one's ever going to hear it again. I suppose because I worked in, because I worked and work in newspapers, I'm kind of used to that, yeah. you know, I know that this is a very disposable kind of, you know, tomorrow's chip paper yeah. and all that. A, a lot of comedy writers can't bear that kind of, you know, but that was really funny and no one's going to remember it in yeah. six months. But if, do we have enough satire? We, you can never have enough satire and the reality is we only have Callan's Kicks, it's the only satire show. There is a difficulty with doing satire on television, which, uh, which is simply budgets. Because you have to either do what Spitting Image did, which is make puppets, which is very expensive, or you have to have such a huge budget for costume, makeup, and all that to make people look like the people, and they're still not going to quite look like them. So, I mean, radio is everyone's preferred medium, I think, for, yeah. for satire. So, yeah. Catherine, then on a, on, a, on a kind of a linked thing, can I ask you about um, your cat? Because the kind of comedy that you do, these mad. The, the mad women that we're all familiar with from your television programs. But one of them, uh, Bernie, isn't it? She is the traveler. So the Bernie Walsh, yeah? <laughs> Bernie Walsh. So what do you want to ask her, huh? How do you, well, how do you walk the line? Because I think you do it. Yeah. Between having this character that's hilarious and is clearly a traveler, but not laughing at an ethnic minority in this country. How do you, how do you square that circle? Um, I would say that because I play her from a place of love and I love ca uh, Bernie, my character, and I don't stereotype her. But she d she's not married, she's not at home, she's in her, her highest and she's going around doing gigs, so she has a great life. So I don't stereotype her, but like... Um, and How did the travelling community, or do you know, how did they react to her? Um, well, I can't generalise them either. Some of them love me, some of them hate me. Um, <laughs> They all, they, they all don't all think the one thing at the one time. So <laughs> that's how much I love them. But I, I came from a small town with a very romantic uh, notion of the travellers and hopefully I can keep that. It's very hard at times, but um, our two main travellers in our town were Ma Mary Kate McDonough and Bernie McDonough and they were singers. My God, were they great singers. And they were allowed into our bars. So I never knew all this thing going on in the outside world where travellers weren't allowed in the bar, we would, they'd come in like the king and the queen and they'd sit down by the lovely fire and then somebody would, by the time he'd have five or six pints and he had a lovely son, uh, um, a Down syndrome son that he doted on. So I had this lovely view of the travellers and um, he, they'd sing a song, those songs would go on for about five days, you know, <laughs> but they were still wonderfully sang. So that was my experience I suppose and from that I had a, a couple of travellers come up to me and say, uh, now, now you don't... You do that uh, woman very well, but a pavy woman wouldn't be half as cheeky as she is. <laughs> no place. Yeah. So, like, but I do. If you if you uh, present something from a place of love, well, then you're not being politically incorrect, you know. So. And that know. leads to the next thing. Then, is there anything 
um, from women who are in comedy, is there anything that is not funny? Is there any topic, subject that's off limits that you just couldn't possibly make it funny? Or is uh, everything up for being made funny? I think uh, everything. I was at um, Jimmy Carr the other day and he made everything funny. He made a drowning in the town that had happened a week before funny. Like, I mean, but that's a talent. That's Joan Rivers has that. Yeah. And Jimmy Carr has that. That is absolute and utter balls, you know. But the thing is that if I, you said there's loads of comedy. Now, I have a problem at the moment. I think comedy is becoming a little bit stale. I think that it's not funny enough at times. We're going into comedy dramas now, and we have all these things that are half funny, you know. And uh, I really hope that women in comedy don't doesn't tame it too much and keep having the the balls to go out there and 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 say a few rude words. So what? You know what I mean? Um, by the way, I got a lot of my comedy from Kerry because my father's from Dingle. Anyone from Dingle in? Yeah. Hey! My father was from Dingle and he was a very, very witty man and he could floor a room with a one-liner. So comedy is a very personal thing, isn't it? And Kerry people I, uh, are great at comedy and uh, thanks for having me down here anyway. So, but I'm not going yet, but thanks for having me. Off limits, or do you think everything should be up for being made a, a, a fun of, um, as long as it's funny? Well, you know, there, there's the old cliche: comedy is tragedy plus time. So, you know, there is uh, personally, there's very little I won't laugh at. I mean, there's stuff, you know, I my heart sinks when somebody shouts Mickey and a room full of people laugh. Please don't laugh. <laughs> You've just let me down. You know, and actually, Mickey is a funny word. You know what? I don't think it's that funny. And, and it Willie is funny. It disappoints me when people laugh because it's really easy. It's actually it's the easiest, laziest way in the world. I like comedy that makes people work a bit personally. Um, I do think. You're not you referring to, to Mrs. Brown's boys now. Right? No, I wasn't. Not for one second. Um, I wouldn't do that. Um, just thought I'd I, ask. I do think that just because. I will laugh at anything, and just because some people will laugh at anything doesn't mean everybody will laugh at everything. And it's a really good idea to take the temperature of a room when you come into it, or, you know, know your medium. You know, I mean, there's stuff that I will write for one show that I won't write for another show. You know, you you'd kind of you have to tailor it. And that's, it, it's not, that's not cynical, that's respectful. That's actually just being aware. There are some people who are very uncomfortable you know, with swearing. I love swearing. Like, you know, I'm from this, you know. But you, well, you, you just said Mrs. Brown's boys, but it no, works. No, Barbara said it. I know, but, but something like that is quite um, um, mediocre, if you want to put a word on it. But it's fantastic. It works fantastically. And it makes a lot of money and it makes a lot of people it's laugh. It's incredibly yeah. popular yeah. And, and good and luck to everyone. That's what television is, is about. Personally, you want to yeah, I don't really find smart. the word Mickey being shouted. Yeah, it's I know. Funny, but, but, that's but then you matter. watch my, my mother and her friends and they watch uh, Mrs. Brown's Boys and they fall around the place laugh, laugh, laughing. And that's what a comedy is about. It should take people out of their worries and their woes and, and whatever they want to laugh at, let them laugh at, you know, because it works. The, 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 the proof is there. It's like saying Ronaldo isn't a good footballer. Do you know? I know, and I, yeah. and I, I'm, I totally agree. You know, but I'm, I'm not a fan, by the way. Yeah. But, um, but uh, I could get something in the next series. Um, but um, no, sorry. I, I, I think it is worth remembering that sometimes people are uncomfortable about laughing at certain things. I mean, you know, there would be a couple of things that I kind of go, oh God. But probably not very many things that I wouldn't make Don't a joke Don't go deep for sure. In, <laughs> you know, in certain say, uh, like, uh, like I understand what you're saying. Like, like obviously, if someone just stands on the stage and goes, Mickey's, that's not funny, obviously, because there's no context to it. But no, but no, but like, you have to have a context to it. Like, you know, if you don't I have a context, I find them so funny. Have you ever seen one? Because <laughs> you have that context to what you're talking about. Like, and a lot of my set would be kind of like about that. Like, but like, like I get you know, I'm more of a storyteller I tell real real stories that happen to me like so for example like there was one time that I went to Slim and World I, I you know I went to Slim and World and I went and weighed myself and you know when you stand up on the scales in Slim and World there's someone usually called Sandra or Mary standing there like went in yeah and I turned around and I was like oh, I don't weigh that much it's not weighing I'm only five foot one and she goes well maybe come back next week and get your one star award and I was like oh is that how it's gonna be? All right then. I went home and I was walking home and I was furious. And I had this thing in my head. I was like, 
I didn't choose the boob life, the boob life chose me. And I said, I'm gonna go home and weigh my kids on a weighing scale and I'm gonna take that one stone off my overall weight. And that's exactly what I did. And I went home and it did, I wasn't getting like, you know, my overall weight, I was getting my shoulder weight and my head weight because I was weighing them like that. So I stuck them through a wooden chair with banisters and I got my proper weight. And that, it's when you use it in context, it's a story you tell with it, but like if you just go on stage and go, Mickey's, obviously that's not gonna be funny because it's no context, it's the context that makes you think. <laughs> Sorry, I felt like I wasn't talking for ages, I just wanted to get that story out there, it's out now. And like if I say, the first time I got laid, I was petrified. <laughs> I kept thinking there's no way that thing's gonna fit inside. What if all my fears are right? What if me fellas too well hung? What if it's long like something from King Kong? And now you're back to my first lay. An ugly little so and so salt. Candy floss and belly one. Or belly, where are we? <laughs> Anybody? And I just go on. So if you put the willy and the, all the sex things in the right context, the context yeah, they are yeah. funny. Like, I like, think they're the funniest, to be honest. It's like, it's like flaps. You know flaps. Have you flaps? Yeah. Most yeah, yeah, but yeah, Sorry, we all we all flaps. 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 That's what I thought you said. Sorry. <laughs> and so I bring this into context then because I want to say that word. So I'll tell a funny story about that. Like the time that me and my boyfriend were watching X Factor and we had a curry and he forgot that there was some left on his finger and I nearly had to go to A and A. I've never felt a bath so pretty full of yogurt and, and milk in my life. That's where you bring it in, that's the context. That's where you do it. Yeah, don't do anything after you've had a curry. Wash your hands, for goodness sake. True story as well. I know we have to be careful on time. Eva, on that note, I think you better book a gig to head here at Bally I think fairly, fairly soon. Maybe throw it over to the floor um, if anybody has any questions that they would like to to uh, ask our panel. I don't know. Have we got roving? Have we got a roving mic? Yeah, we do. Yeah. Um, so has anybody got a question they want to ask? No. No I'm afraid. Don't, don't be shy. Good, Robin, Miriam. Yeah. Um, right, just shout. Here you go. Yeah, take this. <laughs> no, it's fine. I shout. Okay. Um, first of all, thanks a million for being here. I feel very privileged to be in the company of three women who are so talented. It's very hard to do comedy, actually, so you're at the top of your game. I want to know, for each three of you, who's your favourite um, comedy writer or comedian? No. Mm. 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 Mine is Fiona. Who's <laughs> <laughs> second favourite is Eve. <laughs> time was the very woman herself, uh, Joan Rivers. She just said, yeah. Ooh, serious. Yeah. And she flew the flag for women yeah. in comedy. Yeah. Yeah. And she flew the flag for gay people, and she flew the flag yeah. for plastic everyone. surgery. Plastic <laughs> surgery, yeah. She sure did. And fair fucks to her for doing that too. And, uh, yeah, so she is my hero. And her and Beth Midler, actually. Um, and, and given the company we're in, I'm going to choose a, a, another woman, but a different woman, who is Victoria Wood. Oh, yeah. Who is just uh, such a huge influence yeah. on me, like, you know, for writing for stage and writing kind of long-form comedy. And just what a terrible loss, because, you know, she just seemed to have so much more to give and just gen genuine genius. Right, Aoife. Oh, the pressure's on. Um, geez, I don't know, I've so many people that I would look up to, so there wouldn't be anyone really in particular, but I do like, I'm after completely forget his name, but if anyone knows who it is, let me know. But like, I really, like where I wanna start looking at like different things, like, you know, um, like National Lampoon Magazine, the National Lampoon Films, like that, I can't remember his name. No, not Chevy Chase, um, the guy who actually like came up with like, the National, no. I'll find out his name. He came up the whole idea for National Lampoon. There's actually a documentary on Netflix. It's called, um, oh, geez, I'm terrible. I've got to show you the Social media, go for it, Mary. Yeah, yeah, go on, do it, do it. 
it's called no, it's called a, a futile and stupid gesture, and it's based on the fellow's life who I can't think of his name. It's gone from my head now. Fiona, it, isn't it very reassuring when young ones can't remember what they're trying to say? <laughs> I, I, I've got I've got a solid long term memory. Let me tell you, like I went into my local cafe the other day and I seen a fellow there, and I was like, "Is your name Toig?" And he goes, "Yeah." I was like, you were at my 17th birthday party 10 years ago, and this is what you were wearing. And I did say that to him, and he was like, I do have that t-shirt. I was like, I know. But um, I actually don't, I don't know, I have so many people that I would look up to, like, but um, he would definitely be one, because I think he kind of, um, what? Oh, well, Catherine, I, I said you all, I said you already, like, I said to him when he said it. But I don't, I don't know, I really couldn't pinpoint, there's just so many people I would look at, like, now, and I'm kind of putting the spot now, so I don't know. I, is, I, I making, is making people laugh addictive? You know, when you, like you've done here, all of you, you know, have, have made the audience laugh, is that a huge addiction and a huge high, or is it just a relief? It is a high, yeah. No, it's a great high, but when you go out, especially in stand-up, and you're on your own, just say in Vicar Street, I did like nearly 17 nights there, and every night I watched, a, I rang my mother and said, can you please collect me? Please, I can't do it. And there's 1,200 people, and the minute you hear the first laugh, then you're elected, you know, and then, whoa, you, you can actually fly after that, can't you, really? You just... You feel that the world is your, yours and only yours, therefore, and uh, most importantly, the audiences. But you're in a little cocoon of fabulousness, yeah. But. Fiona, after your career as a, as a backing singer for the Joshua Trio, <laughs> did you, were you ever tempted to, to present your own material, to do any kind of stand-up? Do, do you know, the very odd time, it, it, it kind of crosses my mind, and then I, I don't have the courage. I just don't. I would be terrified of it, and it's like, which is insane, because I've written tons of stuff for other stand-ups stand and you know and I've seen my work performed but you can kind of you know if you've written a joke and it doesn't land and you're just in the audience it's kind of awful but you're not at least you're not up on the stage you know but uh, so no I kind of I'm happy I'm, I'm a very shy and retiring person so I'm, I'm well, well, I was just going to say to you as well how does it feel like when you're writing jokes for other people and they um, and they read them out like you like that's my joke like is it kind of like how does that feel like when because like, it's completely different to like what I would like I'd write my stuff and go on stage and say it but like what's it like for you and then like if people are like right like if you're writing the jokes and they're reading like how does like, what is that weird like like well, I, it's say? always been that way for me yeah. and like that's kind of what I do so I don't mind to talk my mother on the other hand is very very bitter about it and actually I'll, I'll tell this because it'll never get back to her my mother <laughs> my mother fucking hates Oliver Callan she really <laughs> <laughs> because she kind of well, she kind of go on about sort of well I can't understand those voices anyway I mean how many people are in that room who's who are they even meant to be we leave all that aside but what she really hates is you know she somebody will say something like you know somebody told me that they heard that on Oliver Cannon I said my daughter wrote that and they didn't know how do people know you wrote that you kind of go this is what I do you know but she can't get over it any time she's ever been, seen any of my stage shows or any of my sketch shows She's always kind of going, well, they got the laugh. You didn't get the laugh. Like, she's outraged on my behalf. Oh, that's, that's, that's as a good mammy yeah. should be. And, and I have to say very quickly, because if, if Catherine's going to yes. crawl into the Kerry credentials, yeah. then I've oh, even yeah. better ones. Yeah. I've Bally Bunyan credentials, yeah. uh, which were that my parents met on the beach in Bally Bunyan. The first time I ever met. Uh, and actually, my dad, my dad was a really very, very funny man. And uh, he, I, and I love this story, it was 19, summer of 1960 and my mum was down on holidays. How old were you? I, <laughs> I drove them here. You <laughs> gave up. Yeah. Um, my mother was down on holidays with some workmates from Dublin and my dad was from West Cork and he was over with his mates and all that and they were, as was the protocol in Ballybunion at the time, and none of you will remember this, my father was on the men's beach and my mother was on the ladies' beach. And uh, the, the lads were playing with a beach ball that kept, you know, by accident on purpose, getting blown over to the ladies' sure. beach and they had to go over to get, get it back and all this. And uh, anyway, the beach ball ended up kind of landing into my mother's group and my dad came over to retrieve it. And this is how they met. But that's not the best part of that story. The best part of the story is the day before, my father had been swimming on the men's beach and had lost his dentures in the no. sea. <laughs> Sorry, the day before he met your mother? Yeah. And so when he met her, he had no teeth, and he asked her to help, like, you know, kind of on the foreshore. So they had their very first date, was this romantic stroll along the foreshore in Ballybunion, digging in the sand at the edge of the tide for my father's teeth. If there's, if there's anything that 
illustrates the generation gap between that generation and nowadays generation of all Photoshop and being perfect. That's lovely that your father had the courage to ask yeah. your mother to we help him find his teeth. As a result of that, we came here for our holidays as kids for years and years. And my, my mother used to always say, we'd be walking back to our chalet. My mother used to always say, that's the spot where we had our first kiss. My, my father would say, yeah, they built a public toilet there to commemorate. <laughs> Listen, as we draw to a close, I'm going to give you a chance to, 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 to uh, do any advertising that you need to. Fiona, I know you'll be recording next week another series for uh, RT Radio 1 yeah. of Waiting. Tell us about that. In the unlikely event that you're in Dublin, the Project Arts Theatre, Monday week, Tuesday and Wednesday, a show called Waiting. It's a six-part uh, comedy sketch show. It's all women, all women. Rose Henderson, Deirdre O'Kane and Katrina Ennis. And I wrote, I'm not in it, but they're all my jokes. And uh, you can go and see it, um, and if you can't go and see it, it'll be on Radio 1 later on in the year, and please check it out. And all your other 450 will eventually bubble to the surface as well in due course after that. Catherine, have you anything up and coming that you'd like to Well, I'd like to ask all the ladies here, I'm entering the Rose Trilly this uh, year. <laughs> and I'd like to get all your votes. I'm going to be the first traveller woman in the Rose Trilly, no fixed abode Rose. <laughs> Is a show coming out, Raised by the Village, which is on. I don't know what the TX date is, but there's always something. And I've uh, a new one woman show and loads of other things that I'm doing that's in the pipeline. The panto this year down in Limerick, actually. I'm going to do the panto in Limerick here. Just, it's near enough, isn't it? Yeah. Bring all your kids, all right? Okay. And, and, uh, yeah, and, and people can find more, more details, I'm sure, on your website. Yeah, but don't ask me to work too hard on no charities, please. <laughs> Oh, I'm the prison <laughs> officer. Tell them about prison. Miriam has asked me. We can we all stand, please. <laughs> <laughs> and just say thank God when I announce I have a boyfriend. <laughs> Miriam, it's like Auntie Miriam out there in RTE. She's so thrilled for me. Every time she sees me, it's not anything you said. Are you still with them? <laughs> yes, Miriam. Thank you for being so kind. She is such a kind. And I just have to say, when she's sitting there, only for Miriam in the media, in RT, I don't think we would be as far. Thank you for all you did for us. Finally, have you anything you, you you've got? Where can people find your books on, on your website? And um, no, uh, you put my actually can, yeah, but like, you, you, yeah, 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 the library. No, no, go, no, go, go and get them in Easton's. I hate, I actually hate that when people turn around going, read that in the library. It's like, oh, did you know you put a ball it? It's only a tenner, like, you know, don't break the bank or anything, like, but um, they like, get it in Easton's, the Ray, like, whatever, like, bookshops, and they actually deal them around the country as well, so you might be able to find them around, like, um, and then, um, yeah, so Easton's. Yeah, yeah, the dentist. Not that. You won't get one of the dentists on the table. Like, no, it's not, it's not that kind of book, like, you know. But, uh, but uh, where else now? Yeah, you get them in all those uh, shops. And I might be bringing out an animated TV series based on that character as well. Still early days yet, but, you know, just see how that goes. And I'll be doing a few festivals during the year as well, like Body and Soul, Electric Picnic, um, Vodafone Comedy Festival. So, if anyone's going to those plans. <laughs> That note, and uh, I think uh, the future of comedy and uh, women in comedy is in safe hands. Uh, I want to thank, I want you to thank as well all my panel tonight, Fiona Looney.